Thank you. Good morning. Hi, thank you for the introduction. Uh, yes, we're going to talk about GraalVM, and uh, we're going to have very uh, intense 50 minutes here. We have lots of content, so we're going to go straight into it, go fast, uh, just like we want our runtimes to be fast and starting really quick. Uh, if you have questions but you don't get time to ask me here and you won't find me later, you can find me on the internet. I almost universally go by Atch Life. Tweet at me, email me, find me on GitHub. Uh, I can answer questions about software engineering, maybe some GraalVM related question. And recently I turned 30, so I feel like I'm old and wise now, so I can answer questions about life advice in general as well. Though, Please do not make any forward-going business decisions based on the contents of what you hear here. Uh, people say this is a very important message, so let's go past this and talk about GraalVM. It's a very exciting technology. It's a, uh, as Mark said, high-performance polyglot virtual machine capable of running programs in different languages. We aim to support all the languages uh, eventually, and currently we have a very good set of the most popular ones in the ecosystems. Uh, how many of you have heard of GraalVM? Just for a quick test. Excellent. How many of you feel that you can ex explain and describe what it is and like why why it exists? Two hands. Excellent. Have been to my previous sessions. Uh, we're gonna remedy that. GraalVM in one picture is something like this. It's a runtime, right? It's a virtual machine. It's a thing that you can execute to run your programs. You can write them in any supported language, so currently that is JVM languages, Java, Scala, Kotlin, Groovy, uh, anything that compiles into the JVM bytecode goes. We have support for JavaScript uh, as a very popular language, including actually uh, running Node.js applications. And we have support for Ruby, R, Python, and anything that goes through the LLVM tool chain. Right? So any native code that compiles through LLVM, we can take the intermediate representation, the LLVM bitcode, and run it. And then at runtime, we try to be a high-performance virtual machine. We want to execute the programs with good peak performance. We want it to be fast, just like probably you want your runtime to be fast. Life is too short to wait for the programs to finish. And then we can execute programs in those languages in different contexts. We can run it within the JVM, and that would be like a proper, normal Java process it will start the JVM. It will uh, normally, our build use uh, Java Hotspot VM. So it will, it will do everything that Java normally does. It will have access to the garbage collection that Java normally does. It will load classes dynamically. It will be your normal perfect Java. It can run within the context of the node application. And that would be normal node application, if you are interested in those things. So it will have the event loop. It will have the signal handlers that node application have. It will be just a normal application. It's just the engine that runs the code within that platform is replaced by, by our technology. And from the very beginning, uh, I think the GraalVM project started something like seven years ago. And it started with the uh, idea that maybe we can write a just-in-time compiler for Java using Java itself. right? Uh, and, and from that compiler, Everything else kind of followed uh, to what GraalVM can do now. And from the very beginning, the idea was that we would like a pluggable system that you can embed in, in different scenarios. So now you can use the GraalVM runtime and put it into your native or Java applications. So if you have a large platform and you want to enhance it with, with the ability to evaluate code in, in say, JavaScript or in Python, uh, you can do that. So. Uh, this way, for example, there exists some experimental builds of Oracle database, uh, because Oracle database is a fairly large native application. So there are experimental builds where you can use GraalVM runtime to run stored procedures and user-defined functions using JavaScript. So normally you would do PL SQL, but in those builds you can use maybe easier to understand language for you JavaScript. Right. And the final mode there in the, uh, in the corner is the standalone applications. Those are the uh, GraalVM native images, which are currently available as an early adopter uh, technology. And this is when we take your Java bytecode and we 
analyze it, and we compile it ahead of time to the native executable for your platform. And the result, it has several advantages. It starts really fast. Uh, it takes less memory at runtime. Uh, and it's fairly small in size. So there are very useful contexts where you would like to just concentrate on that mode. But in general, GraalVM is a large project. It can do many, many things. It has support for different languages. I'm sure you can find use cases for various scenarios here. Uh, and the main ones that we found by talking to people and by evaluating what they say to us and by looking at what they would like to use GraalVM for are the following. So it's a faster runtime. It's really a good uh, virtual machine, right? The compiler, the just-in-time compiler uh, inside GraalVM is a state-of-the-art, uh, well, just-in-time compiler. So there are many, many workloads where it will give you better results than other uh, JVM implementations. So if you want your, a faster runtime for your uh, JVM uh, applications, Scala, Java, Kotlin, and so on, then you should look at GraalVM. Then the GraalVM native images. They offer you immediate startup for the applications. They offer you lower footprint. If you deploy your applications to the cloud, where startup and memory consumption are important, because those are the things you're actually paying for, then GraalVM native images can probably be a solution that you should at least look at to see where it works for you. It's an embeddable VM. So if you have a large application, you might want to provide the ability to leverage code in different languages. If you work at a large enterprise at a, or even a medium-sized company, probably you have code based in different languages. Maybe you want to run this code within a single process, like spice up your Spring application with some machine learning bits written in Python. Because, well, machine learning specialists usually use Python right, for, for everything. Maybe you want to run this in a single process. Or maybe you just want to write your application and use the ecosystem from different languages because you just feel like it. So those are the main values that GraalVM can offer you now. Uh, at least this is what we uh, find when talking to people who evaluated it. And in this session, I'm going to try to go through all of them and quickly explain them and how we achieve those results and give you more information about what happens at the, in the background uh, when GraalVM tries to achieve those. And of course, see some demos, because it's always better to see things than to hear somebody talking about things. When you download GraalVM, you get a following picture. It's a, it's a zip archive or a tar archive, and you unzip it, and you see this. And you can see that this is very similar to the normal JDK distribution that you have. There are all your normal Java commands. Uh, there is Java right there in the corner, Java C, Java P, and so on. So you can use it as your just Java runtime. So you can download it, unzip it, change your pass to this, and, and, and see whether that brings you any performance benefits. You can also notice that there are more commands that you typically don't find in the Java distribution. Uh, for example, the node command, or for example, the Ruby or R, those are the launchers for uh, the GraalVM to run and start executing your programs in other languages. You don't necessarily need to mix all the languages inside a single process. You can just execute them normally. So we ha if you have some code written in Ruby, you just use that Ruby, and it's going to work. Hopefully. We'll see. Right. So this is what you get. How do you get that? It's fairly simple. What, 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 first, we start with the architecture. What happens when you execute our Java command? Uh, we start the normal JVM process, and we built on the Java hotspot VM. Uh, and this is a normal JVM. And what we do, we replace the top tier just-in-time compiler with the GraalVM compiler. This is uh, a compiler written in Java, and it uses the JVM CI interface to integrate with the virtual machine. JVM CI interface, if you didn't know, is the Java virtual machine compiler in interface. Duh. And this is the interface that you implement when you want to supply a third-party compiler for JVM. It means that. Uh, it was added to Java 9, I think, through a JAP uh, 243. And it sits in the OpenJDK, uh, and, and, and it's usable there. 
So through that, we integrate GraalVM compiler with the JVM. With those two layers of, of, of the infrastructure for the runtime, we can run normal Java programs normally, right? The JVM will find your classes, it will look at the bytecode, it will verify it as the JVM normally does, it will load, start interpreting, and at some point of time, it will give the bytecode of the application to the compiler, to the just-in-time compiler, and say, please optimize this for me. And then it will receive the machine code, and everything is going to be splendid, and our application will suddenly run faster. So normally, normally, uh, there will be a different top-tier compiler. If you just download OpenJDK, for example, and you run, you'll have C2 as the uh, most optimizing just-in-time compiler. In the GraalVM uh, process, the top-tier compiler is replaced by ours. C2 is still there because it's a normal JVM, so you can disable the GraalVM compiler and run it normally. So we just supply additional things to the Java distribution. And that's, that's enough, and that is fine if you want to run just the JVM languages, which most probably is what you are the most interested in. How many of you write Java like daily, except weekends? Uh, how many of you use other JVM languages? Scala, Kotlin. Kotlin on here is pretty good. Uh, excellent, quite a, quite a bit. Uh, how many of you run, say, Node.js applications? Surprisingly, not very few. Excellent. So if you run just JVM languages, this is enough. But if you want support for other languages, this is typically not enough. You want additional support by the runtime for the languages. One approach that typically people take is to make an optimizing compiler themselves, to translate the structures and code in a higher level dynamic language, say JavaScript, to the underlying intermediate language, say the JVM bytecode. They manually create this mapping, the compiler, and then they run bytecode normally through this. This is how uh, I think Nashorn worked. This is how Jython worked, the Python implementation for the JVM. And one thing that ha those implementations have in common is that the maintenance burden is quite high. You have to manually translate high-level language into a fairly constrained low-level vocabulary of the JVM bytecode. It is not an easy job. And when the language evolves, it's even harder to maintain this compatibility with the language. So since we wanted to support all the languages, it was clearly that uh, we needed a different approach. So we created a framework called the Truffle framework. It's a framework to create managed languages. It's a framework that offers you an API to describe the semantics of your language. So you need to use that API to, to implement an interpreter for your programming language. Implementing interpreters uh, is a fairly straightforward process. Imagine you have, a, you have a program, you parse that program in the abstract syntax tree, there are nodes, every node specifies one operation, and you just describe the semantics of that operation in, like, in a high-level language like Java. So say a JavaScript plus operation will be left operand plus right operand. Right? You don't have to figure out how exactly the conversion rules work. Uh, you don't have to map that in a low-level bytecode language. You use a high-level language, you describe it, you specify a couple of annotations to hint the Truffle framework what to do with this particular node implementation, and then you're done. This is something what, what people typically do like on the, in the first compilers course or something, building an interpreter for the language. It's much, much smaller effort than actually building a runtime or an optimizing compiler. The downside of that approach is, of course, that such interpreters are inherently slow. They're slow because they're incredibly dynamic, because every time for every operation, they have to do an evaluation of a certain class. They need to call a certain method, uh, something like my node evaluate, just to figure out every single operation. So if you have like a small node that adds two integers, you need to have three virtual calls. You need to evaluate the left operand, the right operand, and then plus. This is going to be incredibly slow, and we don't want that. So how Truffle deals with that problem? We, uh, we run specialization there. We merge at runtime. We collect the profile, and we merge the actual appli application, the program you're running, and the code of the interpreter. We inline everything, and then 
that code becomes much more efficient. And then we pass it to the GraalVM compiler, and it optimizes it again uh, at a JIT compiler level. So machine code becomes quite optimized, and we get good results performance-wise for those languages. For the native languages, since we cannot run just native code in the interpreted mode yet, what we did, we created an interpreter for the LLVM bit code. And through that, we can run native code, and that is used to support the native parts, uh, native extensions for the dynamic languages that uses them. So say you run Python for some machine learning, and then there is a NumPy module, uh, which is how you do calculations. Uh, and it has some Python code, but it also has like, quite a large code base written in, in, I think, C or C++. Right? And we run that through LLVM uh, interpreter in the same process. And since all those languages, they, from the point of runtime, they look the same. Right? They are all just trees written using the same framework. So from the runtime point of view, there is no difference whether you're running code in Python or JavaScript or Ruby. And we can optimize and compile across the language barrier. Right? So we can inline your native extension code into your dynamic language code. So currently, Java and Scala and JVM languages are a little bit different. There is a, uh, a, a more uh, intricate interop uh, protocol needed between the JVM languages and others. But eventually, we will get them uh, to be implemented on the Truffle framework as well. And then they will be absolutely equal in all regards. Right, so this is how it looks when you run these things. How you can run these things is uh, it's an open source project. GraalVM is an uh, open source. It sits on GitHub. You can go there. It's written largely in Java. So as Java developers, I feel that we can appreciate this. You can load that into your IDE. Your normal tooling will work. Uh, you don't need to figure out intricate ways to compile that. It just You understand how the code works. You can go click through the class definitions and feel like you understand what is happening. Um, it still takes a little bit of experience and, and understanding to, I don't know, submit patches and contribute in that way because it is still a uh, compiler engineering. So at least, I think, I think on average, you'd need to put in at least one weekend before you start contributing, probably more. Uh, but it's written in Java, and you can understand what it's doing. And you can see, and if there are any errors, uh, you get proper normal exceptions instead of the sec faults. And, and it's much easier to work with. And you can build it yourself. You can, you can package it. You get a fully functional GraalVM distribution. You also don't have to, because you can just use our binaries. So the team provides uh, builds that you can use just those zip archives that you can unpack. There is the community edition, which is the artifact that you get when you build the open source bits. Uh, and it's really great. It has good performance. It is fully functional. It will run all programs that GraalVM can run. And also, there is an enterprise edition, which is a proprietary product at Oracle. And uh, it comes with even better performance. So the compiler there is optimized more. There are more. Uh, compiler phases and passes that it will do. It will spend a little more time trying to optimize code, but typically it will give you uh, even better result uh, at performance. So currently we have Linux and Mac OS uh, as supported platforms for the binaries. We have an experimental Windows build that, that can do certain things. Uh, so we can experiment with that. But uh, mostly we, we have the binaries for Linuxes and Macs which is good because production typically runs on, on, on Linux. So we can get those. One point which is, I'm very excited about is that earlier this month, we launched GraalVM 19.0, and together with that, Oracle launched GraalVM, Oracle GraalVM Enterprise as a product. That means that Oracle will provide support for it. That means that if you want to use, you can, you can uh, turn to an Oracle representative and talk about that. And that also means that the project has really good chances at being alive for a very long period of time. So you can look into that if you will, if you want, but the community edition is fully functional and you can run it. And if you just want additional performance, you can figure it out later. 
With that, let's go and let's see some demos and let's see what, what performance impact uh, I'm talking about. Let's see. I have this very simple benchmark, and normally I show a little bit different one, uh, also synthetic, but since we are at the spring conference here, I have felt that I should, I should run a small benchmark using the Project Reactor API to benchmark it a little bit. So let me show you how to run it, and then we'll st stare at the code a little bit more. Right, what did I do? Uh, I download my GraalVM. I have my uh, utilities and commands here, which, which if I call which Java, you can see that this is my Java from the GraalVM distribution. If I call Java minus version, you can see that this is a build based on Java 8, right? So when I, when I run my Java commands, this, is, this Java is in my path all the time, right? When I run anything Java, this is what runs. Uh, which should give you enough confidence to just drop it into production without any regard for due process, because I run it on my laptop. No, you should evaluate. But you should know that we run our internal Java applications at Oracle Labs uh, on the Graal VM, and we, we, don't see, we don't see many problems. Right, what do I want to do? I wanted to run the benchmark for you, right? So I will... I will run the following file. I will run without the Graal compiler first to show you the difference, right? I will run my Java from Graal VM, but I will disable the JVM CI compiler, right? This is what I meant when it said that you can run your Java absolutely normally. I can disable the compiler. I can just say, do not use the Graal compiler, uh, and it will run properly anyway, right? So I will start it. We do not use the JVM CI compiler. It will take 40 seconds, and we'll see the results. In 40 seconds, let's look at the code. What does it do? It takes some array of, uh, of objects, integers in this case, and then it has one test method for which we, we uh, check the latency. So lower results will be better, the average time to execute this method. And what we just do, we stream those values, we apply some transformation to them, we reduce them to a number, uh, and then we just collect this pipeline with a block. Right? This may be not the code that you write daily, like unless you're writing applications that transform uh, like 100 integers. But this entertains certain pa code paths in the framework that powers actually the whole reactive, uh, reactive string story. Project Reactor, is, which, is, which is used when you run your uh, spring applications. And while this benchmark is clearly synthetic, uh, you at least know that it actually uses the code that you also use in production. Hopefully, 40 seconds has passed. Right, so we get the number, and it's a fairly large number because it needs to go through all 100 elements, and it needs to create a subscription, subscriber, and all those elements, and push the data through this pipeline. So we get something like 2,400 nanoseconds per operation. So now what we'll do, and I will run the version without disabling the GraalVM compiler, right? So with our Java, which you get from the GraalVM distribution, the GraalVM compiler is enabled by default. So now I will not disable this manually, and I will run it, and we'll see the results. Not to spoil the results, we'll start the benchmark a little bit more. Right. Uh, who thinks it will be faster? Show of hands. I understand your skepticism. JVM is a state-of-the-art virtual machine. It's not easy to be faster than the JVM. Uh, but hopefully it will be faster, uh, because this is a demo. And it would be silly to show you the benchmark where we're slower. Uh, but honestly, I normally on the stage do a different one, so I really am a little bit nervous. I'm fairly capable, sure that this will be faster, but we'll see the results. How much faster do you think? Who thinks it will be faster at 10% or more? Okay, fairly enough. Optimistic people, 20% or more. That's a lot, right? 10% on the JVM kind of can buy you like a low latency garbage collector. When they introduced G1, GC, I think the, the, uh, the idea was that 10% throughput decrease is, is at most what you will receive when you run, let's say, with G1, GC. And I think other low latency garbage collectors also try to have this overhead uh, no more than 10%. So 10% buys you low-latency GC, 20% buys you low-latency GCs and a little bit more. 
uh, anything else is a gravy, right? Anything else you get is what you save uh, in pure money if you run, say, on some cloud where you pay for compute instances. So let's see. And let's see how fast it is or how slow it is. Oh, look at that. The score for running one iteration of this test method is 80 nanoseconds. 80. 24, 2500? 80. My math is not good, but if you divide that, that is 30 times. So with the GraalVM compiler enabled, this benchmark is 30 times faster than normally. That is an amazing result. That is also clearly uh, not representative of wor all workloads that you're going to run. So if you run the application, I don't think you will see the 30 percent, uh, 30 times performance boost. This is just ridiculous to expect that. And it's a, it's a, it's a benchmark shown on stage. So you should take that result with a grain of salt, because we run this on my poor MacBook here, which is clearly not the most scientific benchmarking environment. So you should, you should, you should not trust this number. Uh, you can even see that the numbers below are just data. You have to interpret them in a meaningful and reasonable way. You have to understand what's happening. So this is the pessimistic view on this result. The optimistic view on this result, and this is what I want you to, to, to understand from this number, it, that it's possible that programs written in Java uh, running on the JVM will be significantly faster if you run them on the GraalVM, right? It doesn't have to be like 30 times faster, but even if you get a 20% performance boost, that is a lot, right? So if this doesn't convince you to uh, at least evaluate GraalVM, then I'm going to show you more slides about this. I want to say nothing will, but uh, actually maybe some other things will. Right? So internally, we run tons of benchmarks, uh, and we, we, we get the results. One benchmark seed that we recently uh, published, uh, the, by we, I mean the engineers who actually do performance, was the Renaissance seed. What we wanted to do with that is to gather the certain number of use cases which represent modern Java. Right? So normal benchmarks, we run the CAPAS, we run the spec JVM, spec JBB, all of those. We see those numbers, but we often feel that they are maybe not the most representative of the modern workloads. How many of you like, write fractals for a living? How many of you do low-level math? Clearly, that code gets running, right? Because that's what we build on as a foundation. It's running in the infrastructure. It's the code like that is running in the JVM itself, uh, in the JDK standard library. But maybe, maybe we just use the higher level libraries. Maybe we use some reactive code. Maybe we use some reactive extensions. Maybe we use some ACA. Maybe we, we do some uh, Bayesian reasoning there, right? Maybe we do some Neo4j. Maybe we run with workloads where the tons of objects in memory, and they are, they, are, they are just sitting there. And the compiler needs different set of optimizations to show good performance on those. So we looked at those numbers, and we feel that the, the Renaissance benchmark suite represents modern workloads quite well. So the important bit here is to notice that the GraalVM Community Edition is a little bit volatile. Quite often, is, it is faster than OpenJDK. Sometimes, it's a little bit slower. We run many, many benchmarks. We, if we collapse that to a single number, GraalVM Community Edition comes approximately 1% faster than OpenJDK. Right? So that's an average temperature in the hospital. That number tells you nothing. You have to clearly evaluate that on your workload, on your hardware, uh, on your application code patterns. And what we see there is very often it gives you good performance boost over OpenJDK. So if you understand what you're doing, if you understand the performance patterns of your application, you are welcome to use the Community Edition, and it will probably give you quite a performance boost. The Enterprise Edition, of course, being a product, probably gives you a much more, uh, a better performance boost, and it's universally faster than OpenJDK. So if you don't know anything about performance, you can, you can look into getting that. 
we run other benchmarks as well, and we often blog about uh, uh, what, what happens beside, behind the scenes uh, with the Graal VM. So we, if you use Java 8 and later, how many of you use, run Java 8 in production? Very nice, almost all the way, everyone. How many of you run Java 9 plus? Not bad, I think this is the largest percentage that I've seen from the sessions. Very good, you are very up to date with the common modern Java. So if you run those uh, modern Javas, you probably use lambdas everywhere, you probably use stream APIs, you try to use uh, maybe mutable data structures. On those code patterns, we show really good performance boost. You can read about that in, at medium.com slash graalvm. We show really good numbers for Scala, because Scala bytecode patterns are a little bit different from the normal bytecode patterns that Java programs create, because they need to translate like a higher level abstractions to the bytecode. So they, they do it a little bit differently. And we show really good results on Scala. Uh, but we also, we, we also are trying to be a good open source project. So now in the Graal VM, we have the OpenJDK, the uh, Java Hotspot VM implementation. And OpenJDK projects take the Graal VM compiler and they pull it into their sources because, well, open source. And they package it. So if you run uh, Java, I think, 10 plus, maybe 9 as well. What you can do, you can enable certain common line parameters, some options, and you can get the a version of the Gravium compiler inside your OpenJDK, right? And you don't need to download anything else, and that would be the open source version of the compiler. It probably not be like latest and greatest for the Gra from the Gravium master, but it will be when, when they pulled the sources into the OpenJDK forest when they packaged it. So to, to get that, you need to unlock experimental VM options and use JVM CI compiler. And with those, you are going to be running the Graal VM compiler, and you are going to be uh, experiencing different performance patterns in your application. If you're asking how good that is, uh, it depends on the workload. So we, there are a number of benchmarks where we show really good results. One of them was this. Uh, appropriated benchmark, which, which people show uh, when they want to explain what values the value types will bring you. So it's a benchmark where you multiply matrices and of complex numbers. A complex number is a number consisting of two parts, right? There are two doubles inside it. And in this particular uh, benchmark, the complex number is implemented as an immutable data structure which is very good because as developers, this is what we want. We want programs that are easy to reason about, that are easy to debug, and immutable data structures very often offer us exactly that. It's very hard to figure out what mutates the global state, but immutable data structures are good for reasoning and understanding. What they're bad at is that any operation with the immutable data structures, which normally create new objects, right? When we do any, whoa, 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 when we do any, whoa, any math operations there, right, we create new objects all the time. So Graalvm compiler comes with a really good escape analysis, and it can eliminate almost all those allocations much better than C2 could. So when we run this uh, on JDK 11, again, on this poor MacBook, uh, don't trust those numbers, but you can trust the difference in those. Uh, we get, with the Graalvm compiler from OpenJDK, we get approximately 2x speed up. Again, that won't be your typical speed up on any normal application, but this is something to, to look into. The Enterprise Edition is still a little bit faster, uh, but the Graalvm Community Edition is really, really good too. So you, can, you, can, you should look into that. Right, Twitter is one company that is using the Graalvm compiler. They run their Scala microservices. They travel around the world and talk about that because they want you to run the Graalvm compiler as well because that means the compiler will mature much faster, right? If more people run their code using this technology, the more stable and mature it will become. So for some time now, they don't have any bugs to report to us, so I think they're fairly happy. And what they show, they show reduction both in the CPU user time and they show reduction in the latencies because with the better escape analysis, their programs do not allocate as much data, so they do not pressure the garbage collector. There are some new developments which we put into the 
recently announced the GraalVM 19. One thing is that we compiled the GraalVM compiler with the GraalVM compiler to get the shared library code. Before, it was a jar file, and it had to be compiled at runtime, and it pressured certain parts of the uh, JVM infrastructure uh, as like, it needed to compile itself, and that wasn't super fast to warm up. So now it's a pre-compiled machine code, and it will warm up immediately fast, and it should exhibit all the runtime characteristics of normal JVM with C2. It just probably the resulting code could be faster. Oof. Let's talk about Polyglot really, really fast, because I want to get to the next topic, and there are not super many, much time. Right, let me show you an example of a Spring application where we evaluate code in R. This is the code in R. If you're not an R developer, you can see this is clearly foreign syntax for you. This is what you get when you get an average Java developer write code in R. Probably the most, the mo not the most idiomatic, but this is a functional R code. What we have here is a typical Spring Boot application, right? It starts, it registers some beans, and I'm going to run it. And I really hope it's not going to crash. Right, I run this. The important bits, what we see here, is that we create a bean called contacts, and this comes from the GraalVM API. GraalVM offers API for creating polyglot applications, and we need to build a context to evaluate scripts in other languages within it. Then we evaluate the source, which comes from just a uh, file property, and we get that source, we evaluate that, and then we convert that to Java function. There is a certain API to do normal things, conversions, like integers to integers, strings to strings, collections to collections. We try to provide a reasonable abstraction to make interoperability between languages unified across different languages, and also, well, reasonably enough to work with. So here, we know that this script, this file, gives us just one function, so we can easily just convert that to a function, which is a what? What's, what's that function? This is a Java util function function. It's not even our API anymore, right? This is your normal Java. The best thing is, after that, we just use that normally. We pass Java objects to it, right, which wrap Java primitive values. We apply that, we get the result, which is a Java string, and we just render that string on screen. So, let's see if it started. Yeah, I think it started. It started uh, localhost 8080 load. Right? We see whether it works or not. What this application does, it does nothing. It passes random data, some, some system load average, to the R code, and it uses the R facilities to plot that code to an SVG image. Not the most exciting, maybe, example, but you can see it clearly works, and it loads initially a little bit slower because it needs to load the standard of library, and it needs to compile the code, so it needs to gather the profile, but then it gets a little bit faster and faster. So uh, the data goes from Java, normal Java objects, to our R code. There is no conversion or serialization happening. It's in the same process. And then inside R code, this is fairly interesting. We can use, and when I say R code, this could be any language that we support. It could be JavaScript, Python, uh, Ruby, R, or anything native, right? We can use Java types. And, and use them normally. So here we will have the logger, and we will log some data, both the Java values and some data in the R internal type numeric, right? And you can see the, the logging, the, and they are logging normally without any conversions. And if you actually, if we look here, right, this method has a signature of double and an array of doubles. So we don't even convert like to objects and then do casts. Right? You can use your code normally. You can offer your Java code to programs in other languages, and you can use programs in other languages inside your Java code normally. Isn't this amazing? I will stop this, and I will quickly go back and show a couple of slides about this. Right? Our JavaScript compatibility is off the charts. If you follow modern JavaScript development, there are standards. Right? The language evolves, so we are at the compatibility levels uh, similar to normal Node, similar to the browsers, including the upcoming ECMAScript 2019 draft. It's not even started, but we are compatible. 
because we don't need to manually translate JavaScript to bytecode, and we just need an interpreter. Our JavaScript is super fast. It's much faster than, than previously being possible to evaluate JavaScript on the JVM, if you use Nasworn, for example. Our JavaScript is actually a little bit slower than V8 at peak performance. This is a shame, but we'll get there. The GraalVM team is committed to make GraalVM the best runtime in class for all supported languages. So we want to be the fastest Ruby, the fastest Python, the fastest runtime for the JVM languages, and so on. You can also use that as just a collection of Java uh, jar files and plug them into your normal OpenJDK process. Uh, to be honest, the languages for GraalVM will run the best in the presence of the GraalVM compiler. The Truffle runtime needs certain things from the, from the compiler, certain intrinsics and certain optimizations, uh, which GraalVM compiler accidentally offers. Surprise, surprise. And other compilers do not offer, but they can, right? And, and other JVMs could offer the JVM CI interface, maybe, and they would be able to work with the GraalVM compiler. So you can run GraalVM's JavaScript engine on the normal JDK without any problems. Other languages, I think there are some native parts which might not run very well in this setting yet, but we are in different stages of compatibility. Anyway, our Ruby is fast. Our R is fast. Uh, our Python is the youngest, <laughs> so probably it's not yet very fast yet. And we're working mostly on the compatibility with uh, the ecosystem, specifically to run the machine learning wor workloads. I know that there exists a developer's machine where there are certain patched versions of our Python implementation and NumPy where certain NumPy workloads actually work. So we are making progress there. But if you want to try our Python, please go with your eyes opened and keep your expectations to a reasonable level. I don't want to tell you that, oh, our Python is amazing, and then you will try it and get discouraged, and we'll never try it again. Try it, but promise me to try it again next year as well. Oh, the good bit. You get the tooling. Since everything to us is just trees, you get the tools that can work with all the languages. Right? You don't need to have special developer tooling for any particular language. Because to the runtime, to the platform, all of them are just interpreters written using the same API. So what you can get, you can get the debugger, you can get the profiler, you can get the heap viewer for free for your language. So you can use, for example, Chrome Inspector uh, in the browser to debug Ruby or Python. Uh, you can use JVisual VM to figure out what happens with your Python application, what, what allocates memory or JavaScript application. You can use a sampler to figure out what takes time in your, in your languages, in your programs. And all of those get to you just by implementing the language on top of the GraalVM ecosystem. So that was the polyglot story. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing people trying that more and coming to us and telling us what to improve. But let's talk about the GraalVM native images, the elephant in the room of the Java ecosystem lately. A very hot topic. GraalVM native images available as an early adopter uh, technology. What it does, it can compile your application ahead of time to the native binary. What you get is the fully compiled blob native, of native code, right? You get one file that is, has no dependency on JVM. It will still run your application. It will still run with certain components of a virtual machine that you would expect. Right? You write your programs, and you expect the runtime to provide you with a garbage collector. You expect that your program will work as if memory was infinite. So what you get, you get that, even in the compiled version. It's still a secure execution, so you get the bound checks. There will be no, no, no random pointers pointing in the random memory locations uh, with respect of, without, like, if there are no errors or bugs. So normally, you have the pre-compiled JVM, and then you execute your Java code dynamically on top of that. You load those classes at runtime, and then you compile them just in time. So with the native images, what you can do, you can get just one pre-compiled blob. And it happens like this. We look at all the classes, just literally all the bytecode that will ever be executed inside your program. 
And we statically analyze that. We find which code calls which code. And we, we look at that, and then we compile that. We pre-initialize some data. We write it all into the binary format, and then we just provide some wrapper for the operating system to be able to execute that. You can also compile to a shared library if you want to, but a native uh, standalone executable might be more interesting. So the important part here is the static analysis. We look at the code, and we analyze that statically. That means that we don't execute that, actually. right? We just look at it. And that poses certain challenges and trade-offs. Namely, some things in the Java programs can happen dynamically. For example, you can use reflection, and we, it's impossible to figure out the reflection calls statically. Not always possible. It's not generically, universally possible. So what you need to do, you need to provide some hints, some configuration, saying that, oh, I'm going to use this feature through reflection. I'm going to touch those classes at runtime. And then we can look at those classes, and we can put them into this final executable. To provide the configuration, you need to write a JSON file, which could be a little bit annoying to write JSON files. We know. We know. But it is possible. So proxy configuration, JNI configuration, uh, reflection, require some additional configuration from the developer. The good thing is, as developers, you are the sole owner of the code that you're running. Right? You can do anything, whatever you can imagine, you can do with the code. That's the power of, and the privilege of being a developer. So you can totally do that. Since the GraalVM 19, we have another, uh, another way of providing that configuration. We can run your Java program normally with the Java agent, and every time you use something through reflection, it will gather that information, and it will build those configuration files for you. Right? So you can use this assisted configuration, run your tests, run your application normally, and then use those output files to give them to the compiler for building the final image. So configuring applications became much easier. You still need probably to exhaust all the code paths. But if you run your test suite, probably you are in a much better shape than if you just try to gather those JSON files and write them by hand. The results, the results are fairly excellent. The startup of those applications is in milliseconds. Right? It's, it can start in a like, typical web service in under 20 milliseconds. Those are the startup numbers for native languages, for Go. If you want to rewrite your systems in Go for better startup, maybe you shouldn't. The runtime memory overhead is also quite limited. The thing is, we don't need the machinery to load dynamical additional classes. There is no compiler in there. So we don't need to initialize all those data structures. So we can run with literally just some megabytes of RAM available. And this is really good in certain environments. If you do serverless, functions as a service, or just auto-scaling microservices, this is the thing to look into. Right? So Spring applications, the most important issue here is that currently out of the box, not all Spring applications will work. Allegedly, there is some support in the Spring. So currently, for a year now, since we announced that we want to get live with this, we've been working, fixing issues, and we're working and talking to Pivotal engineers. And, and they made a lot of effort to make the framework code more friendly towards the native image generation. Uh, and the support, the full support, uh, and the better support is coming in the upcoming versions. And we are looking forward to that. And I know the community is looking forward to that. Uh, but currently, if you try, just know that it's not fully there yet. You need to fiddle with configuration. You need to maybe use the certain versions of the GraalVM and Spring or the starter files. right? So there are issues. But the work is ongoing. And the progress has, has been made so far. And the progress will be made further. Uh, you can check into that. Uh, and you can, you can try it. You can also build other applications, uh, maybe a little bit easier. But Spring ones, we are working on that. Right. Windows bits are working. Java 11 based versions are working in the works. When we have them, we will announce them. Uh, GraalVM can do more things, maybe a little bit less interesting for Java developers, but certainly can do them. And just I'm out of time, and I want you to remember that GraalVM is a high-performance polyglot virtual machine 
embeddable in different applications. And you should try this. And if you do anything of that, if you're interested in that, it's a project to look at. Thank you very much.